Job chapter 28. If you wouldn't mind turning in your Old Testament to the 28th chapter of Job, we'll pick up where we left off last week. Bible critics called the book of Job a parable. It is not a parable. It is history. Job lived. Job said these words. Job taught us these truths. I think one of the reasons critics attack the Bible is because of what we're teaching next door today. So all the parents and grandparents, when you talk to your kids after Sunday school, they're learning about Leah and Rachel. Now you know how complicated that relationship was between those two ladies and their husband. So the thing they want them to leave with today is God loves everybody. So even if a man has a favorite wife, he should, well, Leah and Rachel are married to the same guy. I only have one favorite life. Thank God for that. So be gentle, forewarned, if you will, when you talk to your kids on the way home. Another reason I think they attack Scripture is because of what Job is going to write in chapter 28, verse 28. So if you go right down to the bottom of the chapter and follow along as I read from the New King James Version, and if you have a different, different one, hallelujah. And to man, he said, speaking of God, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. God gives us wisdom, and Job is going to explain how he does that in the verses preceding verse 28. Item by item, Job's going to go through it. And the reason men reject God's wisdom is because God requires them to do something with the knowledge that he has just given them, just like he did Nicodemus in that conversation. And they don't want that. They don't like that. They rebel against that. Godly wisdom is knowledge. Knowledge that leads to action. Knowing this, appreciating how much we need his wisdom. That's why God gave us this book, the Holy Bible, so that we can individually and as a group study the very words of God and how they apply to us. This is why James wrote these very useful words. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Chapter 1, verse 5, book of James. So if you're wanting more of God's wisdom, ask for it, and then receive it. God expects us to do something with what he has told us about himself. In Romans, Paul writes, confess with your mouth what you believe in your heart. Chapter 10. Confess with your mouth what you believe in your heart. I'm looking around the room and I'm thinking everybody in here agrees with this statement. God knows the heart, the thoughts, the mind of every person on the planet. Amen? Amen. So why does God tell Paul to tell us to confess with our mouth what we believe in our heart? Doesn't he already know it? Yes. It's for our benefit, not his. It's our testimony to ourselves and to our friends that we believe that Jesus is the Christ. That's the purpose of confession. That's why God told Paul to tell us, say it. Say it out loud. 
Not to convince God, he knows. But to put a line in the sand. To say to yourself and those around you, I believe. This is why God wants us to react to the knowledge that he's given us. This brings us to point one in your bulletin outline. Man has discovered some very amazing things. Verses 1 through 11. Surely there is a mine for silver and a place where gold is refined. Iron is taken from the earth and copper is smelted from ore. Man puts an end to darkness and searches every recess for ore in the darkness and the shadow of death. He breaks open a shaft away from people in places forgotten by feet. They hang far away from men. They swing to and fro. As for the earth, from it comes bread. And underneath it is turned up by fire. Its stones are the source of sapphires. And it contains gold dust that no path, no bird knows. Nor has falcon's eye seen it. The proud lions have not trodden it, nor has the fierce lion passed over it. He puts his hand on the flint and overturns the mountains at its roots. He cuts channels in the rocks, and his eye sees every precious thing. He dams up streams from the trickling. What is hidden he brings forth to light. Job just highlighted all the accomplishments of man. He takes the hardness of the flint stone and creates a chisel that will create channels in rocks. Even in the days of Job, they knew how to take ore that has copper, smelt it, and create copper. Ditto for iron. These were not cavemen. These were men who knew what the world was all about. They saw the earth as a gift from God and they took care of it. They found it precious. Why? Because from the dirt came the grain and the knowledge to grind it in flour and bread. Job just told us that. They knew that it was heat that created the sapphire. He doesn't mention diamonds, but other precious stones were created by God's natural order, which man discovered through science and technology. That's using the things of God to profit mankind. Which brings us to point two. Not all the things that man has learned has been profitable to man. Because he has trouble discovering true wisdom. Verses 12 through 21, if you would, please. But where can wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? Pause for just a minute. If it's not in all the things that he's accomplished in the first 11 verses, if the wisdom of God is not there, then where is it? Asks Job as a rhetorical question. Well, let's see if he answers it. Verse 13. Man does not know its value, nor is it found in the land of the living. The deep says, it's not in me, and the sea says, it's not with me. It cannot be purchased for gold, nor can silver be weighed for its price. It cannot be valued in the gold of Ophar, in precious onyx or sapphire, neither gold nor crystal can equal it, nor can it be exchanged for jewelry of fine gold. No mention shall be made of coral or quartz for the price of wisdom above rubies. The tobaz of Ethiopia cannot equal it, nor can it be valued in pure gold. We pause for a moment. Job has made it clear in all of man's search in the earth for things to benefit himself and his lifestyle, he did not find the wisdom of God. It's not there. It's not in a silver mine nor a gold mine at the bottom of the ocean. It's not there. The birds of the air in the previous section, 
Not there. How about in the pride of lions? Not there. Is it in the deep reaches of the earth? No. Where is it? Verse 20. From where then does wisdom come? And where is the place of understanding? It is hidden from the eyes of all living and concealed from the birds of the air. Destruction and death say, we've heard a report about it in our ears. God understands this way and he knows its place. Verse 23 Wisdom has two parts, a way and a place. There is worldly wisdom, knowledge of how the planet works, science, technology, etc. The way of man can be determined by worldly wisdom, but knowledge that comes strictly and solely from worldly wisdom misguides man. We're seeing that played out in our culture today. When man, when woman, reduces their wisdom to only what man can acquire, they are led astray by what they think they know. Because there's a place for wisdom. That's God-given divine wisdom. Revelation, if you will. This is why in Romans chapter 1, Paul said, when you look at creation, you should know, you should see, you should discern the Godhead, the Trinity. Knowing that, you have no excuse, he writes in verses 18 through 20, Romans chapter 1. Man will not be able to stand before God. Well, nobody told me. I gave you the universe for crying out loud. You learned how to use silicone to make wafers, to make computers, to make phones that you can talk to anybody on the planet from anywhere in the planet, and you couldn't figure out who I am? Go to hell. Did I say that right out loud? <laughs> so God gives us all that we need to know so that we can live this life in luxury but that's worldly wisdom. We need the direction of God. We need to be born again, which is the conversation Jesus had with Nicodemus. He knows its way, and he knows its place. Verse 24, chapter 28, book of Job. For he looks to the ends of the earth and sees under the whole heavens. God knows everything there is to know. Nothing is beyond his sight or his knowledge. Not even the thoughts of your heart. 25. To establish a weight for the wind and a portion of the waters by pressure when he made a law for the rain and a path for the thunderbolt. Think about it. Man can figure out lightning comes down and up from planet Earth. Man can predict weather, sort of. He has learned to weigh the pressure of the atmosphere barometrically. Why? Because God created it that way. He created the Earth with order. He set everything to have its place and everything in its place, including us. Man is discovering that, putting good use for it, and God is saying, now come to me and ask me for understanding, for wisdom, for knowledge of who I am really. Verse 27. Then he saw wisdom and declared it. Are you there? He prepared it. Indeed, he searched it out. 
God saw that we needed wisdom. He gave us his word. He gave us his son. He gave us himself incarnate in Jesus. He gave us his spirit, the paraclete, the comforter that we sang about today. He gives us everything we need for godly life. First Peter, he gives us all that we cherish and know to be good. And some of us refuse to accept it and we ignore it and we find out, why am I so screwed up? Well, when you reject God, your knowledge doesn't do what verse 28 says. Are you there? And to man, he said, this is God speaking, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. The wisdom of God is a call to action. It is not to sit on our laurels and say, okay, I've conquered this book. <laughs> now I'm going to move on to other books, other knowledge. Real science always complements Scripture. Always. The place of wisdom is to take science, technology, compare it to Scripture, and use it appropriately. God has given us all of this so that we can understand what is going on in our world. So what do we do now with what we just found out? In verse 20, chapter 27, Job made it very clear that what we thought we knew led us to do the same thing over and over again, expecting different results by our mistakes. In chapter 28, he's saying, wise up. Wise up. Now, if Job was writing in the 21st century, he might have written... You can't fix stupid. <laughs> Thank the Lord he was more gentle than that. Instead, he said, take all the knowledge you've accumulated about the planet on which you live, ask God how to use it appropriately. Take what you know that I've told you in your own heart and use it appropriately in your life. Make your decisions upon what I have told you about yourself and myself, not what the world says. Which brings you to what's been going on in my life that I want your help with, and I hope this helps you. Last month, Gallup Company did a poll of America. This is the results of their poll regarding sexuality in the United States of America. Among the U.S. adults, that's 18 and up, 90% identified themselves as straight. Among the LGBT community, 37% identified themselves as gay or lesbian. 11% identified themselves as transgender. So if 90% consider straight, of the other 10, 37% of them say they're either gay or lesbian, or 11% transgender. In Generation Z, which is the generation of our grandchildren, that's born between 1997 and 2002, 11% identify themselves as bisexual. In our generation, the baby boomer, born between 46 and 64, only 0.3% identify themselves as bisexual. Do you think the world is winning? Absolutely. They're trying to convince kids that being bisexual or transgender is normal. 
It is not normal. 11% of those polled in December of 2020 of that age group, Generation Z, consider themselves to be transgender. Here is the conclusion that Gallup published, quote, the pronounced generational differences raises questions about whether the higher LGBT identification in younger than older Americans reflects a true shift in sexual orientation or if merely reflects a greater willingness of younger people to identify as LGBT to the extent it reflects older Americans not wanting to acknowledge LGBT orientation, the Gallup estimates may underestimate the actual population prevalence of it, end quote. I don't accept their conclusion. This is the truth. This is their opinion as wavering as it is. I'm not interested in what Gallup has to say. I'm only interested in what Jesus has to say. And here is a quote from Jesus, our King, Luke chapter 17, verses 28, 29. Listen up. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built, but on the day that, the, that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. That is Jesus talking about the rise of homosexuality in the end times, our times. Gallup just confirmed that. Well, duh, Jesus predicted 2,000 years ago that it would increase over and over and over until it became disgusting. This brings me to Satan's latest attack on our kids. Biden's nominees for Health and Human Services Secretary have you read about this? Xavier Becerra, California's Attorney General. Mr. Becerra is best known for his filing of more than 100 lawsuits against the former administration's regulations on health, reproductive rights, immigration, consumer rights. Mr. Becerra has no, absolutely none, medical, education, knowledge, history. He knows nothing about medicine. All he knows how to do is file a lawsuit. And Biden wants him to be in charge of our kids' health and human resources? No. Now, in case he can't do the job well, President Biden has decided to nominate as his assistant, Dr. Rachel Levine. Dr. Levine will be the first openly transgender federal official confirmed by the U.S. Senate. Opposition to her confirmation is being called transphobic. I don't know about you, I'm not afraid of people who want to be a different gender than they were born to be. I don't fear them, I pray for them. They don't scare me. But what scares me is that Satan has gotten a hold of our federal government to join him in attacking you. He is not, Satan, content with attacking the Word of God on every level. If critics of Scripture continue to do what they've been doing for the last 50 years, it is no wonder why our children will be headed the way they are heading right now. Are you sure, Grandpa, this is true? You know, my teacher doesn't think so. 
I know of several grandparents who have already begun to have serious conversations with their grandchildren about this book and what they're being taught. One in particular said to his granddaughter, if you ever have a question about what the teacher is saying that doesn't sound right, you go tell your mom, your dad, and me. If you know it's not true because it disagrees with this, then don't believe it. Amen and amen. Now, how does that play out in what you need to do if you're led to do? Thursday night, the men have been going through First Peter. And we came to this very difficult passage in chapter 2, verses 13 through 17, and I want to read it. Quote, Therefore submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to the governors as those who are sent by him for punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God, honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king, end quote. Those were Peter's words to the church of the first century. God's word, therefore, they apply to us as well. Fear God. According to scripture, that's the beginning of wisdom. According to Job, the quote of God talking to him, that is wisdom. And knowledge is to depart from evil. So as the rest of the world runs headlong as fast as they can to do evil, I say stop. Stand on what is right now. I want you to know up front that not every man in that room had the same interpretation of what Peter was telling the church to do. We did not all agree. Some, let me read the verse, the excerpt that caused the biggest discussion. Every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Verse 13, therefore submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. The question on the table that night was, what does that mean to us living today with what's going on today? Some men said it means exactly what it says. And to substantiate that, they quoted verse 15, quote, for this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Submit, and your silent submission will prove to the foolish men your faith. Those who disagreed quoted verse 14. As to those who are sent by him for punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. In their mind, if the government is telling us to do something that is against God's law, we don't do it. Now, both groups agreed with that. It's just how the, the refusal to do it takes place. As your pastor, I say, get out First Peter chapter 2, read it, come to your own decision. Come to your own mindset. Make your own policy what you intend to do about this passage. As for me, I've already decided. I've already made up my mind. As for me and my household, we will follow God. Amen. I will not submit to the insanity of the great deception that's been foisted on the United States of America and the church. 
on the back side of your outline, I have my ramp. <laughs> One hundred years ago, our nation lived through the Great Depression. Now we suffer through the Great Deception. The lies not only continue, they deteriorate in their perversion of truth. They are what the Bible calls debase. What began in the garden in the beginning has become a national practice of evil with an obvious display of the lack of the knowledge of good. In his book, Lying to You, Jim DeMent examines ten lies that have shaped our world. You have them there. You decide for yourself. In this tiny little book, he goes through all those ten lies that we're being called upon to agree with or be canceled. Ten lies that shape your truth is the subtitle of this small book book they're trying a new attempt with the equality act there is no equality in the equality act I plan to write letters to my representative and senators and have this insanity defeated this is an out-and-out out attack on our freedom as Christians, as parents, as men and women. If this passes, it will be federal law that a school team made up of women regardless of the sport, will have to accept transgender women, men who want to be treated as women. If this Dr. Levine is confirmed, she believes in polygender. There aren't two, there are many. In this book, Rapture Signs by Dr. Bashore, in this tiny little book, he lists all the signs of prophecy that are leading up to the rapture. Therefore, the title, Rapture Signs. He divides all the prophecies of Scripture into four groups. Those prophecies which have already been fulfilled those who are being fulfilled right now as we live today, those that will be fulfilled, and the fourth group are the two prophecies that won't be fulfilled until he actually takes us up and returns. One of the ones that's already been fulfilled, I read from Luke 17. The escalation of homosexuality on planet Earth. Jesus warned us that was going to happen. I wrote, How can we sink? Any, how low can we sink? How can Congress even remotely consider, as our Assistant Secretary of Health and Human Relations, a male pediatrician? who identifies as a woman, who publicly declares there are many genders, pangenders, a doctor trained to heal children, who, if confirmed, will have the power to have children of any age, children of any age, I'm not talking about an adult, I'm talking about a child, trans into an alternate gender. Think of it. A child who yesterday pretended to be a puppy dog or a kitty cat who is still too young to really know the difference between a prince and a princess under this administration will be permanently damaged for role playing, for play acting. 
this pervert will have the power to surgically or medically alter that child with or without your permission. This is insane. God predicted this would happen. We have a choice. We can passively accept the inevitable. God has already told us what is going to happen. Jesus has already warned us that it's going to happen. It cannot be changed. It will happen as God has predicted it. It will happen. It's going to take place. Therefore, since that choice has already been decided for us, the only other choice we have is either to passively accept it and do nothing, sit on our thumbs and pray, Maranatha, Lord, come quickly, or we could do something about it. This is ridiculous. It's absolutely insane. Taking the mark of the beast will not be accidental or incidental. Taking the mark of the beast is not getting the COVID-19 vaccination. That is not taking the mark of the beast. It won't be accidental. See, that's what's going on in 2021. When we were kids, getting a social security number was taking the mark of the beast. Remember those days? Wrong then, wrong again. Taking the mark of the beast is intentional. I know you know that. Do your kids know that? It won't be, oops, I guess I took the mark of the beast. Because on my debit card are the numbers 666. Oh dear, no. <laughs> Read the Bible. Those who take the mark of the beast deny verbally, openly, testify that Jesus is not God. Jesus is not Savior. God is not God. They must bow down and worship Satan as God. That's about as intentional as you can get. It's not a big oops. They need to know that and be forewarned when that really starts to happen in the future. Like Eve, our kids are being deceived. Like Adam, our young men are just falling along. Like Adam, some of our young men have said to God, well, you gave her to me. <laughs> Paul makes it clear. Eve was deceived. She fell into the deception of Satan, the serpent who said, is that what God really said? Did he really say? And Adam went along. We're in the great deception. And it's going to get worse. The falling away is already happening. The great apostasy. Where people are leaving God. There are leaving the church. This is why one of the men prayed today. This is why one of the men was led by God the Spirit to pray this today. May people run to the church and not from it. Because we are in those days. We are in the days, as Jesus predicted, as it was in the days of Noah. Go back and read Genesis 9 and see how bad it really was. We're in the days of Lot. Go back and read the scriptures and see how bad it really was. Go back and read the scriptures and see how bad it really was. Sodom and Gomorrah was so evil. The perversion was so debased. The men of Sodom 
wanted to have sex with the angels that God sent to rescue Lot and his family. How much more debase does our country have to get before we do something about it for the sake of our kids? Why do we teach them next door that God loves everybody if we don't act like God loves everybody and rescue them from all this evil? This is why I'm encouraging everybody who can to come to the first Friday on March 5th, which is this coming Friday, as we seriously, prayerfully discuss all the ramifications of eating the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, the tree that God told Adam not to eat from. And they did. So what did Adam know, and when did he know it? What was the consequence of his action? And how far down has it snowballed today? When Satan can now get his claws in Congress, governor's offices, mayor offices, police departments, sheriff departments, your home. 